Thank you for joining us here on The Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. Thank you for being here. I am very excited about today's show. It's somebody that I have wanted to speak to for a long time. And even though Mr. Bose does not know it, he has been extremely important in the development of uh, my libertarianism and, and uh, thought processes. My guest today is David Bose, who is the Executive Vice President of the Cato Institute and has played a key role in the development of both the Cato Institute and the Libertarian Movement. He is the author of The Libertarian Mind, A Manifesto for Freedom, which I highly recommend, and the editor, editor of The Libertarian Reader. Uh, David, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I want to discuss with you the concept of rule of law. It is talked a lot about in, in the wake of this last election and why it's important. And I wanna get a fundamental definition. When people speak about the rule of law, what exactly are they talking about? A lot of times what we say is that we want to live under a government of laws, not of men. And I think maybe libertarians sometimes bristle at that because they don't like laws, but I think they're wrong to have that reaction. We all want to live in a society governed by law. You don't even have to believe in government to think that you want your society governed by law. Rules on what you can do, what your scope of action is, and what you can't do to other people. So when we say a government of laws, not of men, we mean we don't want arbitrary power. We don't want some king, some president, um, even some elected parliament or Congress just making laws up willy nilly. We want, and, 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 and issuing arbitrary commands and prohibitions. We want a government that's based on relatively fixed and stable and known and knowable laws. We want to know what's legal and what's not legal in our society. And we can talk more later about well, the substantive nature of that law. We wouldn't want to live in a, uh, a country like uh, Mao's China, where you know that everything is forbidden except speaking well of Chairman Mao and doing as you're told. That's, that's clear and predictable, but it's not a what we would call a law-governed society. To some extent, libertarians like Hayek have talked about the law being found. It's not issued by Congress. Um, it, is, it is built up over the centuries, really, by common law procedures. You and I have a dispute. Your tree fell on my lawn. Whose fault is it? Who has to pay for it? Um, and we've had judges and courts work out the answers to those questions. And so in that sense, we talk about law being found, not made. But the basic idea, I think, is that the law is clear and understandable, it's stable, it doesn't constantly change, and it isn't the rule of one man or one woman or a group of people. Um, it is a body of existing law. Is a good illustration of this the difference between legislation through Congress versus executive orders? You know, we're recording this the day after President Joe Biden was sworn in and he issued a slew of executive orders that basically undid a lot of what Donald Trump did. And one of the problems of the last time he was, you know, vice president and in the White House was the unpredictability of regulation versus the predictability of laws passed by Congress. Is that a fair example? of the rule yes. of law in action? Yes, it is. Although Hayek talked about the distinction between law and legislation. Again, the law that is built up over the years, over the centuries by judges dealing with controversies and the legislation that may or may not reflect legitimate law in that uh, instance. So a, a Congress can pass high taxes, discriminatory legislation, um, mandates, prohibitions, and so on within the scope of the Constitution, which we can also talk about. But it's definitely true that we're better off with the constitutional body created to make these laws, which is Congress, Article I of the U.S. Constitution, than with arbitrary individual orders from uh, the president. And you're right, many of Biden's first day executive orders were just re re 
uh, reversing executive orders of President Trump. So that's probably mostly OK. But Biden is clearly planning to do, uh, you know, extend moratoriums on student debt repayment. Um, he certainly talked about executive orders to achieve what he thinks are appropriate goals regarding climate change. So I think we're going to be we, we had a lot of problems with executive orders in the Obama Biden administration, and I expect we will in the Biden Harris administration. And it is definitely a problem for the rule of law. Maybe one way to illustrate the importance of rule of law and the rule of man is maybe talk a little bit about the development of the rule of law. Like I, I recently just took a class on British history before 1688. And you, and this is really where I, I saw the importance of it in the development of, you know, you had the rule of clans and blood feuds, and then you had the Magna Carta, and then you the kings took too much power and rule of law was established. I mean, how did we get to a point in human history where we saw the importance of rule and law and and why should we not give it up as a result? There's been some level of law as long as we can possibly know, because if you didn't have some sense from early on that this is mine and this is not mine um, and that you should not hit me and take my stuff, then we would never have been able to build any kind of society at all. So when you look at societies like ancient Rome, ancient Greece, um, you understand they certainly have a general sense of law, but they also at various points have um, emperors, dictators, um, arbitrary uh, rules being made, uh, people being banned, people being uh, coerced, poisoned. Um, then I think there is, through the Middle Ages, a growing development of law, in, particularly within Europe, which is the history that I know much better. In Europe, after really the Roman Empire, you have a community uh, regarding itself as one community because it was the community where Christ rules. That's what Christendom means. So all over Europe, people see themselves to some extent as part of this Christian civilization. And yet there are maybe 200 different polities, that is countries, principalities, dukedoms, city-states, and so on. And the law is developing somewhat differently in these different uh, polities. And that's a competitive process. People can look and see the law over here is better than the law over here. The merchant law is developing exclusive of any king or prince as merchants need to make rules for how they will live with each other. And then, as I write in The Libertarian Mind, something does happen in the decade of 1215. What we Americans typically know is Magna Carta in 1215, in which not the people of England, but the barons, the lords, confronted the king and said, you've got to stop acting like an arbitrary dictator. Uh, not that they would have known that word. And, and we've written down some rules that we insist that you follow. And it included things like due process and, and when do you get to take money from the people under what rules. But at the in the same decade, a similar thing happened in Hungary called the Golden Bull. Again, barons and lords imposing on the king these rules. And in Germany, the development of what was called Magdeburg Laws, which was closer to a democratic coming together of, you know, the adult free men in the town to form a compact for how we will live together. Now, if you look at these old bodies of law, including Magna Carta, you will see some appalling things in them. You will say, boy, that's not modern liberalism, but it's a start. And several hundred years after Magna Carta than you did, you said you took history up to 1688. That, of course, is the Glorious Revolution when parliamentary supremacy over the king was established. And throughout that process, throughout that time, courts are operating and they are building on the law that exists and saying, well, when this situation happens, we should follow the rule we did in this previous situation. The closest analogy here is this. So the reasonable thing is we say you're at fault. Um, 
And that's how it developed. And then with the enlightenment and liberalism, people start thinking we can rationally examine these systems and we can come up with the set of rules, basically, as I say, uh, the set of rules that begin with don't hit other people, don't take their stuff and keep your promises. Um, and if we just, if we just Im implemented that law, we would have a pretty good rule of law. And to a great extent we do. And that's why after the enlightenment and the coming of liberalism, you suddenly get this tremendous increase in living standards and civilization uh, and population because now Europe can support a lot more people uh, than it could before those things happened. So you may have seen what we call the, the hockey stick chart, obviously the most, uh, uh, arguably the, the most important chart in human history, which is what was the standard of living in the world or in Europe before? And the answer is the standard of living was like this. It was just flat for millennia. And then somewhere around 1750, it shoots up. And in the course of about 250 years, it goes from people in Scotland living in thatched huts with dirt floors to people in Scotland living in high rise apartments and, uh, and ranch houses. So you, you touched on the American constitution and can you talk about the importance of the establishment of the American system of government, specifically the constitution and how it was different than what had what had been in Europe and what had and how has that contributed to that hockey stick? Well, the Constitution, the, the, the Americans in general, people came to America because they didn't like something in Europe. Now, it might just have been that they didn't own land and, and they wanted a place they could own land and things. But a lot of it was they didn't like the arbitrary rules, the power of the king. They wanted to govern themselves. And so they came to America and they started with things like the Mayflower Compact and early state constitutions. And they were building on what they knew from their European experience and also what what they believed they knew from reading the history of Greece and Rome and less successful experiments. Um, they would have been familiar with lots of, uh, well, with a few republics that deteriorated into dictatorships and a lot of kingships that were dictatorial and arbitrary. And when they finally came together in 1787 to write a constitution, they were familiar with all of this history and this law um, and, and, and this political analysis. And they wrote a constitution that is, the, the fundamental point of it is it is based on delegated, enumerated, and thus limited powers. They are saying, we the people, each of us has a right to our property and our, our life and our liberty and our property, and we have a right to protect that. But we think a good way to protect that is to create a system of law and delegate to the federal government some powers to help us live in this kind of society. So they said, we're delegating powers. In Article 1, Section 8, they enumerated the powers they were giving to the federal government. And by enumerating them, they limited those powers. And this is obviously one of the big things libertarians challenge all the time. Where in the Constitution do you see the authority to force everyone in America into a social security system? Where in uh, the Constitution do you see the power uh, to censor radio and television or now to censor the internet? Um, and, there, and there are plenty of problems there, but the fundamental of the Constitution is we found a way to create a government that would regulate the use of power. So power is the big problem. Men want power over others, at least some men do. How do we constrain that? And the constitution was possibly the most brilliant attempt ever to constrain that power to say, okay, we're delegating only certain powers and those are placed in the Congress, which is elected, directly, the House of Representatives, um, and we're gonna have a president to carry out the laws. And it was understood at that time, George Washington really understood. His job was to administer the laws that Congress passed. 
He absolutely did not think he had the right to issue edicts and orders. He was, he was the CEO of a corporation, a government, carrying out what the legislative body uh, had done. And then they set up an independent judiciary to ensure that if these other body, if these other branches of government were exceeding their powers or violating the people's rights, there would be the judiciary, the federal courts, to tell them that they couldn't do that. And also to settle matters of private dispute, especially between people in different states. So the whole idea was to set up a government that would have enough power to protect us from foreign threats and from one another, but not enough power to intrude on our rights. I can hear the listener's thoughts as you're talking. This guy's making a lot of sense. I like a lot of what he's saying, but in 2021, we've got a fascist on the right and the socialist takeover on the left. And, you know, 250 years into the American experiment, everything's just sliding towards that dictator and the Republic, the Republic is falling apart. In your view, how dire is our position in terms of the rule of law versus a power state where two sides fight against each other? And, you know, is how, I guess that's the question is, are we in real trouble or are people in general kind of disconnecting political rhetoric from the actual practice of government in 2021, in your view? Most of what I do day to day at the Cato Institute is criticize and warn about the actions of the federal government. It meddles in too many other countries, uh, getting us into unnecessary wars. Uh, it takes the bread we have earned. Um, it imposes regulations and mandates and prohibitions on us. Um, all of those kinds of things. Those are definitely bad. We should fight against them. Similarly, I am worried these days. You said we're seeing fascism on the right, socialism on the left. We should be cautious about those terms. Germany saw fascism on the right and socialism on the left in the 1930s. Um, and people had to make a lot of tough choices and it didn't work out very well. As bad as I think both the, the, the worst parts of the Republican and the worst parts of the Democratic parties are, they are not actually fascist and socialist. The Democrats are a very heavy tax and transfer party. Um, the Republicans, it's hard to say because they've been the Trump party for five years and that's not what you would call a Goldwater, Reagan, William F. Buckley party. Um, but it's not a fascist party, even though I think Trump had a lot of authoritarian instincts. And I think Biden certainly um, has the idea that I have all these wonderful thoughts about people. I want people to have jobs and schools and clean air, and I will issue orders to make that happen without much understanding of trade-offs, of costs and benefits, of the role of incentives. Um, the, the role of federalism, all of those things, definitely bad. I also think that libertarians have a tendency to believe that the road to serfdom is a description of the world we live in. It's a brilliant book. It's a warning. It's not actually a description of the world we are in, because in a lot of ways, we live in the freest time in human history. And again, I spend most of my day complaining about the ways we are not living up to the rule of law, individual liberty, or the US Constitution. But if we look at the history of the world, or most of the world today, we have to say that in Europe and the United States and an increasing number of countries around the world, we live closer to a society of ordered liberty where each person, as the liberals used to say in the 19th century, where the world is open to the talents of every person. And you know, people who look back on some past, uh, I wonder which past do they wanna look back on? Um, is it the antebellum South when a man could own a plantation and his wife wore beautiful hoop skirts and they had a, they had a beautiful uh, house? No, that was not a free society. What about the early 20th century? Even then, women had a lot of legal disabilities. Black people certainly did. Um, gay people 
uh, excluded from mainstream society. So we've opened up society in the modern liberal world to the majority of the people who were excluded from the mainstream of society in the past. And we have generally freer trade among the developed countries and even with the less developed countries than we've ever had before in the past. For all our complaints, and we have a whole section on the Cato Institute website about our complaints about freedom of speech, we have a lot of freedom of speech in the modern world. And in, in previous societies dominated by the church or by kings or uh, dictators, uh, military juntas, um, there was much less freedom of speech. And so I think we underestimate the good that libertarians and classical liberals have brought to the world and the, uh, the great improvements that we have made in the world. Deirdre McCloskey, who loves that hockey stick uh, chart, calls it the great enrichment. Starting around 1700, 1800, the world started to become richer for the first time. And why was that? Because it was freer, because it had the rule of law and a world open to the talents. Now in 1700, even 1800, it was mostly open to the talents of white men. Um, and now we're open to the talents of everybody. Um, but we, we, we have a great many things to keep us busy fighting for our liberties, but we shouldn't lose, we're not, we're not in a losing battle. We are, we have been winning and everything is always in flux. There are lots of problems right now, uh, but we should consider that we are still leading in the direction of freedom and progress. While I would not call her a libertarian figure, I would look at Vice President Kamala Harris and say this multi-ethnic, diverse family married to a Jewish husband, first female vice president, I would look at that as one of the successes of classical liberalism in that a person who would not have had access 20 years ago, 50, let alone 100 years ago, to a position of power now has a position of power. Do, do you agree with that? And then I would also ask you to define classical liberalism and why is it important? What, what, why has it contributed to that hockey stick and the, the great enrichment? Well, I certainly think it is a good thing, as I was saying, that the world is open to the talents of more and more people. This was true in Britain 40 years ago when the first female prime minister was elected, Margaret Thatcher. That was a step forward for the, the liberal world, whether or not you like Margaret Thatcher's actual policies. Similarly today, I think it's something to celebrate that America elected a black man as president who wouldn't even have been able to vote at the time he was born in many states of the union. That's tremendous progress. Now having a black and Asian woman, and as you say, married to a Jewish man, become vice president. That's a sign of the progress we've made in our society. I personally would just assume that neither Barack Obama nor Kamala Harris uh, have political power, um, but I'm glad to know we live in a society where they are not limited on the basis of their race and, uh, and gender. Um, and that is absolutely the moral arc that accompanies liberalism, bringing more people into the society, being able to draw on their talents. And so, you know, where we really want people to show their talents is not particularly in government, it's in science and medicine and technology and business. Sam Walton's, you know, some redneck guy in Arkansas developed a way to get cheap stuff to poor people and working class people a few pennies cheaper than anybody else could. He was a tremendous benefactor of the world. And it's good that he lived in a system where he could do that good for people. Um, look at Silicon Valley, you have immigrants from all over the world, from Russia, Asia, Ukraine, Hungary, um, contributing to the fact that you and I can talk across not even wires across wireless connections, hundreds of miles apart or thousands of miles apart. I've, you know, I, I 
did one of these uh, podcast interviews with people in Australia that ran for 24 hours long with different speakers just a few months ago. Um, Silicon Valley and a few other places in the world gave us that sort of thing. Now, <laughs> I think you also ask what is classical liberalism? So classical liberalism is the political philosophy, the political movement that puts liberty at the center of its concerns. So it may have other concerns, um, peace, dignity, courage, compassion, equality, equality and liberty go together. We, we are all equally free. We are all equal in the eyes of the law. And sometimes libertarians forget, you know, we, we hear equality and we think somebody wants to take half my money and give it to other people. Um, but what equality fundamentally means is that each of us is a human being with the same dignity and the same rights as every other person. And so classical liberalism is the set of ideas and the movement that took us from this very poor, basically subsistence world that not that many generations ago, our ancestors lived in to the great enrichment and a world in which a gay half Indian immigrant can become the prime minister of Ireland. A Japanese immigrant can become the uh, president of Peru. Um, and a woman whose parents came from Jamaica and India can become the vice president of the United States. But even more importantly, that talented people can, talented people can use their talents in technology and medicine and science and business everywhere in the world. My final question is uh, for the anarchist listener who's listening there going, yeah, all that's great, but what about the rule of law? What a law is immoral? Why, why should I have to follow that? Why can't I just break the laws that I think are, are immoral? I mean, what do you say to somebody who says the rule of law is great, but why should we follow a law that we don't think is moral? Well, the first point is, even if you are an anarcho-capitalist, you want to live in a law-governed society. You want to live in a society where it is understood that other people cannot hit you, cannot take your stuff, uh, and where you can count on people to keep their promises, partly just because that's the right thing to do and partly because we sign contracts and they will be legally enforced. And they can be legally enforced even if you don't have a state. We would still have lawyers, contracts, courts, protection of private property in this ideal, possibly, possibly could exist, anarcho-capitalist system. Um, one reason we should obey the law is that the fundamental laws, what Hayek called law, not legislation, are the necessary way for us to live together, unless you just want to be the sort of person who puts on Viking horns and invades the capital uh, and, and takes what isn't his, um, then you want to live in a society where we understand these rules. And even when, man, that guy has left the keys in his car, I could just grab it and run. Um, you should know that that's wrong. And you should also know you do not want to contribute to a society where things like that can happen. So there are bad laws and there are times when it's appropriate to break bad laws. Um, that's what civil disobedience is about. Um, but in general, the fundamental laws that we're talking about here in terms of a rule of law are based on these, this concept, don't hit other people and don't take their stuff. And even the laws that we disagree with, I believe we're better off in a constitutional republic where we can try to get those laws overturned than we are in a war of all against all, where if I don't like the laws, I don't obey them. And if other people don't like the laws, they don't obey them. And, and I know there's a distinction between a law that tells two adults they can't have sex with each other um, and a law that seizes the property, the, the business that I've built and takes it to the government. But not everybody's gonna see it quite that way. So 
better to use our Republican processes to fight the laws that are bad and defend the laws that make sense. Yeah, I mean, does the rule of law really constrain the government? I mean, a lot of the rules of the, the conversation that we've had today seem very common sense, but when you look at the lockdowns or you look at other other uh, places like it, like the, the takings case in Seattle where they set up the, the chop zone, I mean, does the rule of law appropriately address government encroachment? It does. The rule of law does constrain government. You know, I was asked once by some skeptics of libertarianism, what's the greatest libertarian accomplishment ever? I said the abolition of slavery. And they said, okay, name another. Now, I thought the abolition of slavery was pretty good. <laughs> I think if you have the abolition of slavery on your resume, you are ready to meet your maker. But they said, name another. So I thought a little more carefully. And then I said, bringing power under the rule of law. So that was the fundamental libertarian achievement. Books would say liberal achievement, but to me, it's the same thing, basically. So the fundamental libertarian achievement is bringing power under the rule of law. Has it been a success? Yes, incredibly so. Um, look at the decline. Steven Pinker talks about the decline in violent death over the centuries and the millennia. And that's very impressive. And that's, that's part of bringing power under the rule of law. So does it constrain the US government? Well, how many times has somebody proposed something and other people say, oh, that goes against the First Amendment? And it doesn't happen. Courts strike it down. The Second Amendment, D.C. outlawed uh, the private possession of, of handguns, and the Supreme Court eventually told them, no, you can't do that. The Second Amendment means what it says. Um, both the Obama administration and the Trump administration lost a lot of unanimous decisions in the Supreme Court. They tried to do things, and the court said, that violates people's rights, or even more fundamentally, that exceeds the powers granted to the government. So yes, it, so yes, the rule of law does constrain the actions of political leaders and even Congress and parliaments. Does it constrain it enough? No, I don't think so. And Cato's Center for Constitutional Studies is constantly busy arguing and filing briefs in court saying this, this is not constitutional. The court needs to strike this down. And they don't always listen. We don't win all those cases. Um, but we win some of them. Sometimes we win most of them in a given Supreme Court term. So we need to do better. And that's why we have a libertarian movement. That's why we have a broad liberty movement, because the government does exceed its powers granted under the Constitution. And it violates the rule of law when it does that. And we need to fight back against that. We need to organize. We need to go into the courts. We need to uh, be involved in elections. We need to be involved in writing and, and making film and making memes on Facebook, all the ways that we communicate these ideas and also not just communicate the ideas, but force the government to respond to them either by repealing laws, which sometimes happens, um, or by striking down laws in the court or by electing new people to office. David, Bo David Bowes, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Again, make sure you check out the Cato Institute and visit cato.org. Libertarianism.org is a tremendous website, tremendous resource, and make sure that you buy The Libertarian Mind, The Manifesto for Freedom, and also The Libertarian Reader. Both are tremendous books, and I thank my guest David Bowes for joining us. And thank you so much for listening. Oops.